In today's lab, we'll be preparing lighter desserts and exploring how you can lighten up traditional recipes for desserts in ways that uh, contribute less fat, less sugar, and therefore fewer calories. I'm Emily. And I'm Pam. And we're going to be talking about some of those methods for lightening up desserts first. And then we'll prepare a lighter version of a traditional short crust pastry. And we'll take a look at that. So uh, one approach to lighter desserts is to simply think about different foods that you can use as dessert. Yeah. Uh, you know, here in America, we often think of cake and cookies and ice cream as some right. of our traditional dessert choices. But in other cultures, they may incorporate fruit and nuts as, uh, as sort of a palate cleanser at the end of a meal and um, basically filling in that uh, dessert position. Mm -hmm. So what we'll do today is work with some of our traditional recipes for cakes and cookies and ice cream, and we'll be lightening those up. And some of the ways we'll lighten them are by uh, considering the sweetener that's used. Mm -hmm. So for example, some of you will be making a pumpkin pie that's prepared with, um, with an artificial sweetener. And some of you will be using different fats, for example, using oil instead of a solid fat, and that will help you to use a little bit less and also avoid saturated fat, which makes it a more healthful choice. And in some instances, we'll be using a fat replacer, for example, using pureed fruit in place of um, oil, which works really well with moist desserts. So what we'll challenge you to do when you're evaluating those products today is to consider whether or not those modifications are acceptable. Do you, know, do you end up with a product that would uh, take the place of a regular dessert in a way where you like it, you like the texture, you like the taste? For example, products made with an artificial sweetener, you might pick up on sort of that bitter taste, um, and perhaps that's not acceptable. Um, or perhaps you know, products that are made with less fat might be a little bit uh, crispier or not as um, not the same mouthfeel uh, or some of the products that are made with a gluten-free flour perhaps you don't care for the texture so we'll want you to evaluate those different products and make a decision for yourself whether or not those lighter desserts are, are a good option Okay, so we're gonna start by preparing a reduced fat short crust pastry. Mm -hmm. Now I'm not calling this low fat because it, it, it is a little bit lower in fat than a traditional short crust pastry might be. A traditional short crust pastry would be about three to one dry ingredients to fat. We're gonna bump that to four to one. So we're still gonna be using some fat in there. Uh, we're gonna need that in order to come out with a, a good product, an acceptable product. And when I think about an ideal short crust pastry, you know, think about um, a pie crust, for example, um, or perhaps if you're using a crust for a pot pie, right? These, these crusts can be used for both savory dishes mm -hmm. and sweet dishes. Right. In lab today, they'll be preparing pies, but this could easily be used for something like a, a chicken pot pie, for example. Um, and I, I like to talk about ideal outcomes because this has changed over the years. For example, back in the 1400s, they used to refer to a pie crust as a coffin. <laughs> And perhaps that was because it was the crust used to bake birds <laughs> in the crust. And it, it actually wasn't consumed. It was actually part of a display set before a king. You might think of that old nursery rhyme about four and 20 blackbirds and the king counting his money. Um, anyway, the, ki the king is presented with this, this pie and it's filled with birds. And when it's cut, the birds are still alive. And that was because the crust was so dense. Um, it actually was not edible, but it, the birds were able to survive the heat of, of cooking. So we would prefer that we make a crust that isn't like that coffin. <laughs> we would prefer to have a crust that is both flaky and tender. So it needs to be rigid enough to support the filling that's in there and be able to serve a slice of pie, but it needs to be tender enough to be enjoyable. And, and part of how we uh, achieve both tenderness and flakiness is about how it's prepared. So in this reduced fat crust pastry, we'll still be working with um, some solid fat. So what I'm gonna do is again, mise en place, we'll take a look at our recipe. Right. And one of the things you wanna know with your recipe is whether or not you're gonna have a baked pie crust or whether you'll, um, for example, you'll bake the crust and then right. fill it, like you might do with a cream pie, for example, or whether the crust will be baked as part of the uh, recipe, like for example, with an apple pie. Mm -hmm. We'd have a un unbaked pie crust and we'd fill it with apples and, and finish it off. So in this recipe with our reduced fat pastry crust, um, we're going to start off by creating a slurry. And a slurry is really just adding some um, cold liquids to flour here. So the recipe for, for this reduced fat pastry crust calls for the flour to be divided. And to our, to our flour here, we're going to add three tablespoons of ice, ice cold water. And we keep the water nice and cold because 
we don't want um, any heat to melt the fat that gets added to this recipe. So we'll add our tablespoons of, of ice water there. And um, we're going to add a little bit of um, vinegar to that as well. And we'll just use our whisk to create that slurry. And so that, um, that water is going to help to hydrate the flour. And remember, whenever we're using a, a gluten-containing flour um, and we add water and manipulate it, we're developing gluten. Now, one of the things you want to pay attention to is how much added water gets added. Right. And Yes, because if you have more water, you're going to have the development of more gluten. Right. And having more gluten is going to make it more tough. Exactly. So you don't want to add a lot of excess water. But we'll see how this looks when it's done sitting. We might decide we're going to need to add a little bit more mm -hmm. water, but you don't want to start out with that because too much water added in the beginning um, might end up with sort of a soupy mess. So the next step, we're going to um, take our, our dry ingredients here. We've got the remaining amount of flour, and we're going to add um, a little bit of powdered sugar, just, just a little bit to give it a little bit of flavor, a little sweetness, and a little bit of salt. And in this recipe, the salt is important because the fat that we're going to use is essentially flavorless. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be showing you how to cut in some shortening, which... Right. You know, if you want to explain what shortening is. Yeah, so shortening is a solid fat. And unlike lard, it doesn't have that same strong flavor. It's pretty flavorless. And as Emily had mentioned, you're adding the salt because this adds flavor to it. Both lard and the shortening are waterless. So there's no water in that. And remember when we were talking about the gluten, the, that's not going to create gluten formation. And having too much gluten is going to create a tougher texture there. Now, lard and shortening are going to have the fat that melts and creates that great flakiness that you want. And we, we can get those um, that flakiness by using a pastry cutter or pastry mm -hmm. blender. That's what this tool is. You see it has these, these rigid blades. And what we'll do is we'll actually um, cut the fat in. So, right. you know, unlike a cookie recipe or a cake recipe where you might use a wooden spoon to cream the mm -hmm. fat, um, here what we want to do to achieve that flakiness that Pam was describing, we w actually want to get this shortening incorporated in really small bits. Right. And so you... You want those small bits because then those are going to melt and help create that flakiness. So butter and margarine have water in them. So when we added this water before, you may add less water to the recipe because butter and margarine already have some water in there. So if you were to use oil, you're not going to have these clumps of fat and that's going to prevent you from getting the flakiness that you want in the crust. It's going to be shorter strands of gluten and it's going to be almost mealy, the crust instead of flaky. Right, it's almost so tender that it's mealy. Mm -hmm. And some of you will be preparing a pastry crust that's actually made with oil, so we'll be able mm -hmm. to compare that. Um, you can actually, by manipulating the dough enough, you might be able to incorporate enough air to overcome that mm -hmm. mealiness, but you'll notice how tender uh, your crust is. Right. I just want to show at this point, I'm cutting the fat in using the pastry blender. And if you didn't have a pastry blender, another technique would be to use two knives mm -hmm. and to just draw them across one another to cut that fat into the, the desired piece size of, of the shortening. It takes a lot longer, so if you have a, a pastry blender, mm -hmm. use, you that. use that. But this could work in a pinch. And you'll notice that in your recipe, when you're making a short crust pastry, it will tell you the particle size you're aiming for. So mm -hmm. in a traditional short crust pastry with more fat in there, it typically will um, tell you to aim for pea size pieces, right? So you would stop cutting when, you're, when your cut in fat looks about piece, uh, a pea size, um, which means you're going to get a nice large flake from that. You'll have a really flaky crust all because right. all that fat's added. We have to stretch the fat in this recipe a little bit further because it's low and fat with right. that four to one ratio. So in this recipe, I want to take it until we get about coarse meal. So we'll keep cutting that in until it's pretty uniform. And you'll notice some at some point it'll start to clump 
clump together a little bit. And we're not talking about the clumped particles. We're just talking about the, you know, the amount that right. we've cut that fat into. And shortening does work really well in a short crust pastry because we're able to cut it in. It's, it's um, soft at room temperature. Mm -hmm. um, we want to avoid handling it with our hands as much as possible so we don't melt it and right. essentially create a liquid fat. Um, but it works real well and it, it doesn't have a lot of flavor. It's also, because it's a vegetable product, um, you know, from vegetable oil, it's more useful on a variety of diets because right. lard, even though lard would be an ideal fat for a short crust pastry, it is an animal fat. And so a vegetarian right. diet, for example, could not use lard. Some people are kind of turned off by the really strong flavor of lard too. So it's actually kind of hard to find in the grocery store. Um, you know, I remember my grandmother used to collect the rendered fat when she yeah. would prepare chicken or, or some kind of beef, and, and that would become the lard that's used in a pastry crust. So very economical, but maybe not the most healthful for today's standards. Okay, so we've got about coarse meal here. And at this point, we're going to take our slurry, and we're going to add that back in. Um, your recipe says to toss it with a fork but you can tell that might not toss all that well. So what we basically need to do is just get this incorporated. Um, and we'll see, what the, we'll see what our mixture looks like. We might need to add a little bit more water, but we're gonna try not to. So we just basically need to bring this together so that we can roll it out to create our pastry crust. So we'll use our fork to just move that around. Try not to use your hands because, again, at this point, you don't want the heat of your hands to melt that fat. Yeah, we don't want to melt it yet, right? We want to melt it, like when Pam said, to create that, that flakiness. All right. So in, in some of our recipes, um, you know, based on the type of, of fat you're using, you're trying to get the best of both worlds. So you're trying to get uh, both a flaky crust but a tender crust. Right. And so a lot of recipes for a short crust pastry will actually call for a blend of fats. You might see a recipe that uses um, some butter and some shortening. So you know the butter, the margarine, it's still a solid fat. You can still cut it in, uh, but it will help to impart some color too to the, right. the final crust. So you'll get more of that golden brown color. Whereas it, with an all shortening crust, it isn't going to impart any color. So sometimes you use a blend of fats to uh, affect the color. Um, sometimes it's because you want a little more flavor added to. Um, butter and margarine may have salt added and right. you know, sort of that, that buttery taste that you also don't get from a shortening. So this is coming together pretty well. I'm pressing it with the fork and you can tell that it's, it's sticking together. And that's a good sign. Um, again, I'll keep doing it with the fork so that I don't add any heat from my hands, but I want to make sure that I can get this to the point where I'm going to roll it out. And um, we're about at that point, and then I'll show you a, a technique for rolling it out. Okay, so at this point, our dough is all prepared, and what we're going to do now is I want to show you a shortcut for rolling this out. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you've tried this technique before, but um, I think it's great because it cuts down on frustration of getting a nice uh, uniform dough to place into your pie plate. Um, and as a, as a kid, I used to be tasked with making pie crust a lot. <laughs> My mom grew rhubarb in the backyard and every summer I was on rhubarb pie duty and uh, I really didn't know what I was doing when I created a pie crust and one of the things I found very frustrating as I tried to roll this out in a hot humid environment is that my pie crust was always ripping when I went to put it into the pie plate. So when I discovered this approach to rolling it out, I thought, oh, I wish I'd known about that when I was 12. So what we're going to do, we've got some plastic wrap put down on our surface, and I'm just going to take the, the dough that we created, and we're going to just form that together a little bit um, and place that on our, on our plastic wrap. And you can start it out with the shape that you're aiming for. Now we're going to be working with a round pie plate, so I want to, you know, basically get this in a disc shape. But if you were baking um, pie crusts for another purpose, for example, maybe you were going to make a casserole size mm -hmm. pot pie or something, you're just going to roll your pastry crust out to fit that. Okay, and Pam's going to place that right. second sheet of plastic wrap down. And so the other thing is you can see through it, which is really helpful, so you know what's, what you're doing. We're just going to take our rolling pin. And the idea here is that we want to have a nice uniform thickness to our pie crust. And so to do that, you should be rolling from the center out with quick strokes. 
again, remember that rolling is a form of manipulation, and so that is, um, to some extent, developing that gluten protein complex. Now, I just want to pause here, and if you notice, um, you can see these striations in the dough. Right. And that's a sign that that fat was cut in. Um, if this had been creamed, you wouldn't see a separation between the, the different colors in the, in the dough here. Um, the other thing we can do is readjust the plastic wrap if you notice that it's getting stuck. But what we don't have to do is go back and forth with our, with our dough like I used to do as a 12-year-old when I was trying to make rhubarb pie. So again, short strokes out from the center. And we just want to get this to the point where the diameter is wide enough to fill our, our pastry plate. And you can check that. You can gauge that by taking your dish and just you know, seeing Pretty how simple. you're doing. Yeah. So we got you know, some areas there where it won't be, enough, um, won't be wide enough to fill the depth of our plate. So keep in mind, if you have a really deep pie plate, you're going to have to roll it wider. OK, so we'll keep rolling this out. Um, this is enough dough here to make a one crust pie. Um, one other way to lighten up your dessert is to consider cutting the amount of crust in half. For example, maybe your pie doesn't need a top crust. Maybe you could finish it off with something crumbly like nuts, for example, and, and add a, a source of nutrition that way instead of more crust. Um, and in some instances, you might decide to do away with crust altogether. For example, if you were making a quiche, maybe you would do a crustless quiche or use a different um, crust like something made out of uh, wheat germ, for example. All right, so you can see that that's getting pretty thin. And if I wasn't doing this between the plastic wrap, it would be ripping. All right, I need to get a little bit wider on the one side, and then we're almost there. So we'll just go this way. Again, those quick, using the quick um, out from the center rolls will help us to have a more uniform thickness overall. And I think we're there. We'll just separate that a little bit. This will go into the freezer for a, a little short time and about five minutes or so. And that's just going to help to um, firm up that solid fat again, the shortening that's right. in there. And that's really helpful because then when we bake this off in the oven, the, the gases and you know the gluten structure, all of that will expand at the same rate. So we'll, um, we'll pop that into the freezer, and then we'll show you how to put it into the pie plate. Mm -hmm. So now Pam's going to demonstrate just placing the, the dough into the pie plate, and then I'll finish off the crust to get it ready for baking. Um, you know, the plastic wrap comes off very easily, which is another, way, another reason why I like to roll it out this way. And you'll notice she's just going to kind of carefully lay it over. And then we'll finish easing the dough into the pan. You want to be careful not to stretch the dough into the pan because once you bake it um, and, and the protein structure firms up, it, will, it could shrink if you've stretched it into there. So she's got it laid across the dish nicely. What I'm just going to do is pick up the edges and just ease that crust into the pie plate, again, so we're not stretching it. And sometimes you'll notice if you don't have a, a perfectly rolled out crust, um, you might have to fix some sections. Like over here, it's missing a little bit. So I'm just going to grab my palette knife, and we can easily take some, um, I'll just take this for a second. We can sure. easily take the excess dough from a side that's maybe a little heavy, and we can add it to an area that's a little scant, like over here. And that'll be okay because we're going to fill this with something, so you won't even see that part. Yeah, so we'll just ease that in. All right, and that looks pretty good. Again, if it did rip a little bit, you can just fix that edge a little bit. All right, so the next thing to do, you could bake it off like that, but it's not very pretty. <laughs> so we'll clean up the edges here. I've got a little bit too much excess here, so to even it out a little bit, I'm just going to cut off wherever there's excess. And I don't have a whole lot of techniques for making a pretty pie crust, so I'll show you the, the technique that I have used for years. And that's simply to roll that excess dough underneath the edge. I'll just use my fingers like that. And um, then what I like to do is just go around and crimp it with my fingers. You could also use a fork and use the tines of a fork to right. press around the edge. Um, I find that crimping it with my fingers adds enough decoration to the plate. But certainly, if you had other skills and wanted to be fancier, you could apply those here.
So we'll just roll that around. All right, so all the excess dough's been rolled under, and now I'll simply go ahead and, and just pinch these into place. And that will help to anchor the, the crust a little bit to the edge, um, and also just give it a little bit more uniform and decorative finish. And then finally, you'll want to check your recipe again and see, are you baking the crust before you fill it, or are you going to fill it and then it will it'll bake with the filling in the oven? And so if you were going to uh, fill it, if you were going to bake it before you fill it, you would want to uh, prick the bottom of the crust with a fork. And I can demonstrate that here. And that's simply to let um, steam escape. You don't want to have any large pockets form when it bakes. So we got, we've got the bottom pricked. We can also go around the edges a little bit and prick that. Um, if you were worried about, you know, holes and having your contents uh, leak, some people like to use pie weights. Uh, an easy way to use pie weights is to sort of make your own right. with dried beans. beans. Right. Yeah, and you could, you wouldn't want to use those beans after using them as pie weights. You just keep <laughs> them for that purpose. You wouldn't want to try to uh, cook those later, but that can also help to hold down um, the crust. But pricking it helps to prevent those large bubbles too. Um, and you'll just bake that off, and then we'll have a crust that you could use for any purpose. You could fill this with a cream filling. You could um, you know, use this for a uh, chicken pot pie or something like that, a more savory dish, and, uh, or a quiche, like I mentioned. And it should have enough rig rigid structure so that it supports the filling when you take out a slice, um, or perhaps um, you're going to cover that with another top pastry crust too, and, and that should be rigid, but ideally your crust should be both flaky and tender to have an ideal outcome. So here we have the final product, and as you can see, we pricked it, and so we don't didn't get those big bubbles that we could have gotten if we didn't prick it and the air got trapped in there. And then you can see the blisters here, which are a sign of the flakiness of the crust. Now, Going back to what we talked about in the beginning about how we wanted this to be a little bit lighter, we added less fat. We had the four to one instead of the three to one ratio with the dry ingredients. And then we also have a thin crust here rather than having a thicker crust, which would be more calories. We only have one crust. Again, if you had the double crust, the crust on top of it, again, that would be extra calories. So enjoy preparation of the lighter desserts today. This lighter, uh, you know, reduced fat short crust pastry is just one example about how you can cut down the fat to lighten up a dessert, but we'll try those other applications in the rest of your recipes today.